Hey guys, welcome to our online Bible study for Rock Hill Baptist Church. My name is Aaron Adalian. I am the children's pastor here at Rock Hill. And today we're going to be looking into the book of Ezekiel. We're going to be kicking off our first session in this study. And we're going to be looking at specifically who Ezekiel is and how God commissioned him for the work that he was to do. And so if you have your Bibles, grab them, turn to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to be in chapter 3. Um, and so Ezekiel kind of takes place um, during the time of the exile uh, in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar took over um, and there's a first exodus of people that Nebuchadnezzar brings with him um, and, and takes it to Babylon. Then there's the second group that does it, and he does it four times. But Ezekiel's in the second group of people that are taken from Babylon, probably around 597 B.C., about eight years after David would have been ta- or Daniel would have been taken. And so it would have been kind of the second deportation of the people of Israel under the rule of Babylon. And so um, Ezekiel, at the beginning of his book, he, he comes out and says that he lives among the people in exile. And so at this time, Jerusalem is still present and, and still a place with the temple intact. Um, and so Ezekiel is going to be given a message to the people of God. And so in the very beginning of Ezekiel, he talks about a vision that appears to him. He's, he's out by the river um, of the city, the, this, this canal that, that, that kind of irrigates the area. And he, he goes into this vision and he sees these beings that are holding up this throne. And, and they're, the beings act as like, like a chariot, but they're alive and they're, they're beautiful, but scary and, and magnificent. And, and so Ezekiel seeing this and, and on this throne is this, this being that, that looks as if it has the glory of the Lord. And of course, we believe that to be God Almighty because he claims um, later on to or the beings claim or, or it may be Ezekiel um, claim that he is the Lord and, and, and to praise the Lord in his place. And so Ezekiel has this vision and he sees this um, the glory of the Lord on a throne being carried by these magnificent creatures um, with these wheels at the bottom. And, and what he's ultimately going to see is, is this presence of God leaving the temple, but making its way to Babylon, that God hasn't left them as a people, but that God is still very present and God is still working. And so that's kind of the message of what Ezekiel is. However, God's not done with what he is doing. And so Ezekiel's going to be telling about the torment to come. The, the, the more that the, the pimple will be destroyed. The, all these things. He's going to be pointing to what God is still doing. Um, and that God's not, his presence not leaving. It's with them in Babylon. But God is going to use Babylon to carry out the mission of what he was doing because the people of Israel have fell flat on their job of being the people of God. And so we're going to be in chapter 3. Um, and so e- Ezekiel chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 8 through um, 21. And so and so he's he's sitting at this this canal and he receives this vision um, from God and um, and he and he sees he sees sees the glory of God and telling him that that the people that that he, that he is going to go to are a stubborn people that they're hard headed um, and, and he tells them that they won't listen to his words so he's already being told that. He's going to be doing a job that people won't like and people won't listen. This happens, this vision takes place in the 30th year of Ezekiel's life, which would have been the, the year that someone kind of moves into their priesthood if they're a priest. And so what, they, what they're kind of telling him, uh, what God is kind of telling him is, is that Ezekiel, you're going to be, 
you're going to be taking on this role of priest and prophet and no one's going to recognize you as it. That the words you're going to be telling them are going to fall on deaf ears, but you're going to be delivering my message. And so we get to chapter 3, um, and we're going, to, we're going to go ahead and read through, um, through our, our time. And so, but they, they would know he was, a, and God said that they would know that he was a prophet when they find out the things that he had told them would take place, had already taken place. And so, um, so Ezekiel was living a life where he's not going to get credit for anything until it's already too late. I mean, that's kind of the story behind Ezekiel. He's telling the Israelites, hey, you've done all this stuff. You've rebelled from God. You've done, and it's too late. You're going into captivity. You're going to be in exile as a people. Not just, not just the people that have been taken, but everyone. The people of God is going to be living in exile. And so, um, chapter 3, verse 8, let's read it together. It says, Look, I have made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. I have made your forehead like a diamond, harder than flint. Don't be afraid of them or discouraged by the look on their faces, though they are a rebellious house. So first, right off the bat, we see in in verse 8 that God is telling them that they're hard-headed people um, and that God has made him hard-headed to, do, to, to be the people to, or be the person to take the word of God to them. And so Ezekiel has a holy hard-headedness. I wish, I wish my hard-headedness, when I thought about it, was holy hard-headedness. Um, holy steadfastness. Too often, my hard-headedness is just very much like the Israelite people, wanting to be rulers of myself, wanting to choose my way instead of God's way. And that's what the Israelites are doing. And that is the hard-headedness they are in. And, and what God is telling Ezekiel is, I have made you hard-headed and steadfast in my ways. And that is why you qualify to be bringing this message to the people. This is one of the reasons that how the one of the ways I have equipped you for being the deliverer of this message. And so we'll go to chapter or verse ten. It says, "Next he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully to all my words that I speak to you, and take them to heart. Go to your people, the exiles, and speak to them." Tell them, this is what the Lord God says, whether they listen or refuse to listen. So God's already setting this up, saying, hey, you need to go to the people that are the exiles, your people that you are amongst, and speak to them and tell them that this is what God is saying. And he tells them, now you are to do this whether they listen or not. It's probably already starting to become very evident um, to to Ezekiel that the people of God are not going to listen or like this message. It's probably already conjuring in his mind this these thoughts and ideas of how he's going to be treated because he's going to be delivering this message. And so um, verse 12 says, The Spirit then lifted me up, and I heard a loud rumbling sound behind me. Bless the glory of the Lord in His place. With the sound of the living creatures, wings brushing against each other, and the sounds of the wheels beside them, a loud rumbling sound. The Spirit lifted me up and took me away. I left in bitterness and in angry spirit, and the Lord's hand was on me powerfully. I came to the exile at Tel Aviv, who, who were the exile that, exiles at Tel Aviv, who were living by the Chebar Canal. And I sat there among them, stunned, for seven days. So Ezekiel gets there, and, and he's told what he must do. The Spirit of the Lord um, then lifts him up and takes him back to where he's having this vision. And he hears this rumbling sound, and it's these creatures, these magnificent creatures that are doing this. And as they're pulling away, he says, 
what? He says, bless the glory of the Lord in his place. Now, we don't know if that's Ezekiel saying that or, or if it's um, these beings that are saying it. But what we do know is that that in and of itself tells us that the, the being on that throne is God. That the being on that throne is, is either, either Ezekiel thinks it's God or the peop, or the, or the, 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 the creatures that are holding up this throne um, are making an announcement that it is God. And so we can rightfully assume that that presence in that moment is God speaking to Ezekiel. And so with the sound of the living creatures, wings brushing, and so these creatures, they describe completely how they look in, in chapter 1, um, and it goes into great detail, and they have wings and everything. And so the great sound of them moving and lifting and coming off, but after... After he comes, comes to where he is, it says, I sat there among them stunned for seven days. So God, God kind of gives him this, this calling, this commission. Hey, you're, you are to go to the people of Israel. They're not going to like what you say. They're not going to listen to what they say. They're not going to recognize you as a prophet of God. But they have been a stubborn nation. They have defied me. And because of that, they will be in exile. But I want you to know that I'm not leaving them. The presence of God will be made known in Babylon. And so, I think for seven days, Ezekiel sits there. And I, I kind of wonder, when I read through this, I go, what is Ezekiel doing for seven days? Like he has this new perspective. He looks around him. He sees the exiles, these stubborn people, and he sees around them. He sees them. He sees these people that are the reason for why they're there. I wonder if he. I wonder if he felt anger towards those people. I wonder if he felt embittered towards those people. I wonder if he felt like the people were taking advantage of the system that God had put in place for them. You know. I think it would be easy to fall into a, a very critical view of seeing people in that moment and choosing to blame them for the way things are instead of serve them the way God asked him to do so. And so seven days he sits. Seven days, I don't know if he's meditating. We don't know if he's meditating. We don't know if he's praying. Um, but man, I, I, all I can think of is if I put myself in that position with a greater perspective, it'd be hard to look on everything the same. Um, and so often with a critical spirit, I could get to a place where I blame others and I withhold them the goodness of our great God because I see how they're living and deem them not worthy. So we want to be weary of that, aware of that. So let's get to verse 16. It says, Now at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. So at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord comes. Son of man, I have made you a man over the house of Israel. When you hear a word from my mouth, give them a warning from me. So he comes and he says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman. He, he identifies him. He says, hey, this is who you are. This is who I made you to be. And this is what you're going to do. And so check it out. Son of man, I made you a watchman over the house of Israel. When you hear a word from my mouth, give them a warning from me. That doesn't sound too bad, but here's where I think. Here's where I think God's telling him and giving him a warning into, hey, this is what I called you to do, and this is what you're going to do. I think in, that, in those seven days, he may have had a thought like Jonah, like, this is... They don't deserve this. I'm not going to deliver this to them. I am going to sit here and watch this happen. That's kind of Jonah's take on things. And so I wonder if in those seven days, Ezekiel is working through that in his own life. And God just shows up and speaks to him, right? And, and this is he says, hey, this is what you're going to do. You're going to deliver a warning from me. And this, this is where... I think if you had any internal struggle, 
God makes himself known as the authority and sovereign God over what is going to take place and that it is not about ourselves. So check this out. It says, if from my mouth give them, if, well, sorry, if I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, but you do not warn him, you don't speak out to warn him about his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person will die for his iniquity. Yet I will hold you responsible for his blood. So I wonder if he's sitting there for seven days going, I'm just going to watch this. And then God says, hey, listen, whatever you let happen to them, it's on you. It's gonna, you're going to be the one. You're going to be the one that pays the price for it. And so, man, I, I think I, I read that and I go, holy smokes, God's telling him, get up. It's time to get to work, right? Um, and so, verse 19, But if you warn a wicked person and he does not turn from his wickedness or his wicked way, he will die for his iniquity. But you will have rescued yourself. Now if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and acts unjustly, and I put a stumbling block in front of him, he will die. If you did not warn him, he will die because of his sin. And the righteous acts he did will not be remembered. Yet I will hold you responsible for his blood. But if you warn the righteous person that he should not sin, and he does not sin, he will indeed live because he listened to your warning, and you will have rescued yourself. And so that's kind of the commission of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is told that he is going to deliver a message to a people of God who, who are in defiant who are defiant people, who are rebellious people, who are stubborn, hard-headed people. And he is to go and tell them the message of who God is anyway. And God even tells them that they're not going to listen to you. That they will, not, they will not accept you as a priest or a prophet. That it won't be until you're gone, until they recognize what you have done and telling them, what is, what is taking place. Or what it, won't, it won't be until these things take place. Man. And then God assigns him to the mission. So he tells him what's going to happen. And he assigns him to the mission. But in between, he does something very, very specific. And that he is, he identifies who he is. Now, God did this with Gideon also. He addresses him as warrior. And so, but God, as he, as he talks to Ezekiel, tells him, you are to be a watchman over Israel. He, he gives him a title and says, this is who I made you to be. And this is what I'm creating you to do or made you to do. This is what I've made you to do. And so he gives them, he tells them, what, tells them the plan right? He identifies who he is, and then he sends him out as a part of the mission. Um, and so Ezekiel, throughout the rest of the book, is going to be showing the people of Israel what God is planning to do. But I kind of wonder if we have gotten, if we would have gotten the same call that Ezekiel did, how we would have responded. To go to people that are suffering because of their own sin. To share with them the love of who God is in the midst of knowing they may not ever listen. I don't know that that's very different than sharing um, who Christ is today. And I would say that we have that same mission. I think it's, it's really important for us as we look at the commission of Ezekiel that we look into ourselves and see what it is that we are withholding from, from following God. Does that make sense? So oh, how, how we are not um, telling others about God or who we are to be telling about God. You know, I think it's easy to see someone and judge them by the way they look. 
it's easy to withhold information, withhold prayer, withhold caring, withhold, withhold all these things. And it's easy to blame them for their own circumstances. We are not to ask why. We are not to ask how. We are simply supposed to deliver the message of Christ. That's what Ezekiel was given. Man, I pray that as we go, that God would use you to deliver the message of Christ to His people. It doesn't matter if they listen or not. We are simply to sow seeds. And He will make them root. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes makes the seed turn into good fruit and, and, and prepares the soil to receive it. It is all about the work of God. We are simply to go and follow and listen. And so I'm going to pray for us. Um, thank you for joining us. But let's pray together. And then um, as you go, be thinking about how you can specifically be sharing the love of Christ with those that are hard-headed. I know I'm hard-headed sometimes, but let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, you are good, and you are great, and you are wonderful, and we, we love you. Um, man, Lord, I am, I am hard-headed in so many wrong ways. God, I pray that I would be steadfast in you, that I would be resilient in you, that I'd see people with your love, and that I would share your love with others. God, I pray that I would sow seeds for you, God, and that you would prepare the soil and that you um, would, would, would be the one who, who reaps the harvest, God, that you would be, Lord, the one who moves, that you would do what only you can do. God, I thank you for Ezekiel and his calling. God, I pray that as, as we endure um, a society that is, that is not about the love that you have, that we would continue to point um, them towards you, that we would share your love with them. God, I thank you for this message today. God, I pray that you would speak to us and speak through us. We love you and praise us. I praise you uh, in all that you do. Um, in Jesus' name, amen.